1500 hours, August 2010. We're flying at 20,000 feet. Our team, which is led by my best friend Steve and I, are on our way to Ruby, Alaska in search of a monster known to many as Bigfoot. The descendants of an unholy union between fallen angels and the daughters of men. Modern day cannibalistic giants that grow to 12 feet tall and weigh over 1,000 pounds. These creatures are fast, aggressive, and very territorial. They are known to rip a man apart limb from limb and devour him as foretold by the Book of Giants. My name is Roger and I've been called many things. To some, I'm a crazy man. To others, a hero. But in reality, what I am and what we do is hunt monsters. Our objective is to hunt and kill the clan north of Ruby, Alaska and cleanse the earth of these vile creatures. This story is the tale of our expedition. The events detailed here are all true. Many of you think you know what Bigfoot is, but you don't. You are ignorant to the reality of what it is that you face and you assume that you're safe. I can assure you that the world is full of dangerous monsters. And if you actually knew the truth, you will realize that our world holds many terrifying creatures. Just the sight of these creatures causes the hearts of the best men to falter. On a plane, the 5,000 mile flight to Alaska was just as I expected it to be, full of jokes and laughter. After all, the crew we had was a mixed bag of sociopaths, psychopaths, and one techie. I'm not sure about the company you keep in your life, but these guys, they're a handful. Now for the crew. Steve and I go back, way back to the fifth grade. I'll never forget the day I first met him. It was cold as shit. And in the infinite wisdom of St. Rita's private school, they decided to let the kids out on the yard for recess. Now don't let the name fool you. St. Rita's was a private school, but it was kind of rough. To this day, I don't understand why Steve's father insisted he attended the school anyway. I guess you can say his father believed in tough love. As for Steve's family, now they're rich. And I'm not talking about bullshit.com stock market rich. I'm talking about oil money rich. The type of rich no one in his family really had to work for the next seven generations. But his dad was old school. He drove a beat up pickup truck and made sure he counted every penny. Steve's older brother worked at McDonald's his entire senior year at high school. Anyway, back to the story. That day, Steve was on the yard, surrounded by some of the less desirable kids in the sixth and seventh grade. And true to his MO, he didn't know when to back down and he damn sure didn't know when to shut up. I couldn't stand by and watch them just beat him up. So I interceded, trying to help out, only to take that ass whooping with him. Ever since that day, Steve and I have been best friends. And man, what friends have we been? Our friendship has taken us all around the world. And we got into some crazy shit. I'm talking about drunken fist fights on a beach in Ibiza, chased by tigers in India, arrested in Moroccan whorehouses. The list goes on and on and on. The sheer and utter delight and danger that we have experienced as friends is just incomprehensible. It was all fun and games until one evening in the jungles of Venezuela, we ran into something that should not have existed. This creature had the body and the face of a woman with wings like a bat. It ruined our expedition and killed 50% of our crew. From that day on, we decided to hunt and kill these abominations wherever we may find them. Which brings me to the next member of our crew. It was on an expedition to Africa in search of the Lion Men of Judah that we found him clinging to his last breath. Vital was 18 years old when we discovered him, hidden inside of a hollowed out tree stump, clutching his empty AK-47. He was a fierce child soldier. Vital's parents were killed when he was 10 years old. His mother brutally raped and his father killed before his eyes. So for the next eight years, he was forced to fight and kill indiscriminately. During that time frame, he became one of the most feared soldiers on the battlefield. So feared that the other generals decided that it was better to take his life than let him take over their army. So one night, the general sent 30 soldiers to kill him. By morning, 30 men lay there dead and Vital was gravely injured. When Steve and I stumbled upon him in the jungles, he was barely clinging to life. And for
from that day on, Vital has been with us. I witnessed him kill a full-grown lion with nothing but a 45 and a machete. He's a six foot eight African badass with a serious attitude problem, but we love him to death. Also with us is Charlie. He's pretty new to the team. Graduated from MIT with a degree in information technology, then went on to work to Microsoft. He was there for two years before he got caught hacking. You know, Charlie really gives me the creeps. You know, he reminds me of one of those guys on to catch a predator. Except for Charlie's the kind of guy that'll hack your baby monitor and watch your wife breastfeed. He's sick. I repeatedly told Steve that I don't care for him and I don't even want him around. And truthfully, I hope on this trip, Bigfoot shoves a keyboard right up his ass. That way I don't have to be bothered with him anymore. He serves as our tech guy, setting up cameras and stuff like that. The geeky stuff that allows us to see what's coming to get us before it gets us. As for the rest of the crew, they're all ex-military contractors. Karate Kid, who's my boy. I love him to death. He's our point man, and he looks just like Ralph Macchio. Chef, who's our cook and deadly with anything with a sharp point on it. Scissors, who got his name torturing jihadis in the Middle East. And last but not least, Gentle Ben. I think this son of a bitch is Paul Sasquatch himself. Six foot eleven, two hundred and seventy-five pounds of lean muscle. Ben. Now Ben, Ben is extremely fast and agile for a side. And the worst thing about Ben is he's unstable. And he's triggered by the least of things. Just last year, we're in Saudi Arabia at one of the market. And this street vendor decides to start laying into his wife. I mean beating her up foot to mouth type ass whooping it looked like some wwe shit going on in the middle of the street steve and i just kept walking it wasn't any of our business but no 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 not ben ben had to get involved for some reason this stranger beating his wife triggered him and i don't know what it was maybe his father used to beat his mother's ass when he was a kid and he would witness it but oh my god he walks up to this man and with one hammer fist, BAM! Smashes him on the top of the head. He falls to the ground and he proceeds to start kicking him over and over and over again. In about 20 seconds, it's all over. But there's a crowd surrounding us all at this point in time. Ben looks into the crowd with this look on his face. Like I dare any one of you to do something. And not one person moved. Yeah, Ben is our boy, but Ben is unstable. And he's got problems. It was this crew of men that landed in the Beechcraft 450 at a tiny airport in Ruby, Alaska. And after a long process of unloading our gear, we all headed up the Mezzanine River in a, in a few small motorized boats. Now you need to understand something. On the Mezzanine River, they don't really like you using motorized boats. It's more of a recreational type river. You find people kayaking and things of that nature. But we didn't have time for kayaks. The area we were headed to was 15 miles up river. And we would have to travel 3 to 5 miles north into the wood lines to reach the area we knew the creatures lived in. The ride up river was slow and rather uneventful. You know, we saw a few grizzly bears, a moose here and there, some oversized beavers, but nothing really exciting. But one thing that did kind of pique my interest was for a while a grizzly bear decided to run along the banks following us up river. After a few hundred yards, he decided we would not worth his effort, so he ran back off into the woods. When we reached the area marked on the GPS, stopped, pulled up out of the water, and headed into the woods. Now, this terrain was like nothing I'd ever really seen before. The Seeker spruce trees went on for miles. And the only good news was that the woods in this area wasn't really dense, so you had a good line of sight and good vision all around you. With our equipment gathered, we embarked on a hike towards the base of the mountain range. Now, I'd been all over the world and been in some creepy paces, but... There was really nothing quite like this. The feeling that this place gave you was just being so isolated. It was different. And from the minute we headed into the woods, I had the feeling that something was watching me. Even Ben commented that something had eyes on us. He could feel it. The spot we had picked to camp for the night was about a mile and a half away from where we suspected that the Bigfoot's territory was. So we got to work cutting down trees and making a sufficient base camp. Charlie and Kid ventured out to set up night vision cameras and perimeter sensors, while the rest of us set up tents and solar power supplies and the rest of the equipment. By nightfall, we had finished our prep and were set up. Roger rested in his tent, while the rest of us were just sitting around telling stories. Somehow, during the time we were setting up, Chef had ventured out and killed one of those oversized beavers, and by the time he finished with it and added some rice, you'd have thought we were eating at Applebee's. So around 10 o'clock, just when we were all about to settle down to rest, one of the perimeter alarms on the north side was triggered. Of course, 
Everyone huddled around the little table that Charlie had set up as a monitoring station, and we discovered two grizzly bears moving silently through the woods. Now that is weird. Grizzlies are normally a solitary animal. You rarely see two of them together, ever. Just then, the two animals stopped and began to sniff the air with the nose pointed upwards and to the north. Then a larger one slipped on his hind legs and began to growl and roar. This sound echoed through the night air. And then the second one did the same thing. For a moment, they just stood there, staring into the darkness. Then came this vocalization like nothing I had ever heard. One of the bears took off running full speed out of the view of the camera. And the other one again stood up on his hind legs and growled. Next we heard what sounded like a tornado coming down the mountainside breaking trees, rocks falling, and this yelling that was almost deafening. This grizzly bear took off south, heading straight for our camp, and within 45 seconds, a 400-pound grizzly bear was bolting through our campsite and headed south towards the river. Ben, Ken, and Chef grabbed their weapons, preparing for whatever it was that was chasing it, but the sound stopped. Looking back on it, I believe that this is how they first came to know exactly where our campsite was. Later, this would be a major problem and one that will almost cost me my life. The following morning at dawn, we all ventured northwards towards the area where we had heard the sounds coming from. Now the terrain in this area was quite different and sloped steeply uphill to the point that each step was difficult. Kid who was on point radioed back to us that he had found some large broken trees up ahead. Then a few minutes later, he said something that let us all know we had reached these creatures territory. What in the name of Jesus? He sounded frantic when he told us about the huge trees driven into the ground upside down with their roots exposed. Some were older, but others were fresh and had just been placed. By the time we reached Kid, I died with his finger on the trigger. This might not be such a good look for us. Whatever did this had to be huge, Kid said. Steve looked unfazed as he inspected the tree a signal for us to venture further beyond what clearly was some type of boundary line. As we moved deeper into the wood lines, it became evident and clear that we had reached some type of plateau. And I couldn't help but feeling like I was invading some type of foreign soil. The wood seemed completely still. Not just silent, but still. Almost as if the trees themselves was anticipating something happening. We didn't have to wait for long to discover what it was. Ben, who was covering our six, shouted, Contact! Then let loose from his weapon. Then it went silent, and he shouted, Target hit! Rushing towards the direction in which he fired, we discovered blood splatter and hair. This thing had to be fast. It took us less than a minute to get to the very spot he was shooting at. From there, Kid fanned out, looking for a blood trail and any signs where it went. Only to return five minutes later saying he had lost the trail. It was like the creature had just disappeared. For the next two hours, we explored every square inch of that plateau and found all kinds of signs that this was indeed their area. Broken tree limbs that they use as markers. Huge structures made of broken trees. This was a jackpot. Everything was here except for the clan. Now the climb to move further north was way too steep. So we decided to head back down towards our campsite. After what happened today, everyone knew there would no longer be a need for us to go out looking for these things. They were going to come to us. And when we arrived back at the campsite, Charlie was already working to move his motion sensors out 200 yards away from the camp. He said after hearing all the gunfire in the distance, he knew tonight we were in for some shit. And boy, was he right. No sooner than the sunset, we began to hear them from every direction. There was this whooping and then this screaming, almost as if they were calling out to each other over a long distance of miles. Then around 10 p.m. that night, everything went silent. Steve looked at Ben and Chef and said, hey, get ready. I think they're coming in for us. Charlie had this small drone that he flew up into the air just to inspect the area to see what was surrounding the perimeter. And from this bird's eye view, we saw 15 heat signatures all around us. We were surrounded on all angles. But for some reason, they were staying beyond our perimeter. 
We didn't know what they were going to do next. But I knew one thing. We weren't going out to them. They were going to have to come to us. Ten minutes later, the northern perimeter alarm went off. Then seconds after that, the southern perimeter alarm went off. Then the east and the west perimeter alarms went off. They were moving in. You could feel the ground rumbling as these things ran in at us. They would run just beyond the area of the lights, almost as if they were running zigzag patterns crossing around us. This full speed running back and forth, left and right, north, south, east and west, went on for the next 15 minutes. I think they were checking our defenses for some type of weakness. Then it started. A full sized tree came flying in over our heads, hitting one of our lights and knocking it down. Chef and kid who were covering the south began to fire their weapons. Steve and I began to fire. Ben covered the east while scissors covered the west. Back to back with our backs turned to each other. We fired round after round and clip after clip. Charlie huddled in the middle of us with his computer trying to find out what was going on. And he kept calling, incoming from the north. Incoming from the south. Incoming from the east. After what felt like an hour of pure madness, Ben got completely and totally enraged. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye going to his case and grabbing his AA-12 shotgun. Once he began shooting that shotgun, all activity ceased. And high above us, from the area of that same plateau, we heard a scream so loud and so powerful that I knew that this was just a test. The real danger was whatever that thing was at the top of the plateau screaming and giving orders to these creatures. That we would discover the very next night. The following morning, camp was a mess. Three out of our four lights were destroyed and they had thrown full grown trees at us. Charlie started his bitching and moaning about not being safe. He wanted to leave. The little wussy acted like he had a choice in the matter. Steve was clearly perturbed as he walked around the perimeter. I hit three of them in the chest multiple times, he said. So did I, said Ben. I hit two of them with the AA-12. What was most confusing was that there was no bodies. Vitor, who I only saw one time during a firefight, was not in the campsite. When Steve and I realized this, instant panic set in, and we began to look around for any signs of where he might have gone to. Fanning out in all directions, we moved around searching for him, and just as Steve and I began to assume the worst, he signaled us from high in a tree. Now somehow, during a firefight, he managed to flank these creatures and get well behind them. Vital went on to tell us that he observed them during the fight that these animals carried their wounded and dead off when they left. He also told us that when they left, they scattered in all directions. Vital believed that this was not just one clan, but it was four clans that we were up against. I have to admit, I was impressed. How the hell did he pull this off? And for the first time, I began to think that we had bit off way more than we could chew. A huge part of me wanted to leave, and Vital even said it. This is a fight we cannot win. But I knew Steve, and we weren't going anywhere. When we returned to camp with Vital, there was this synchronized exhale and a brief moment of relief. But as soon as Charlie started yapping about wanting to leave, the shit hit the fan. Steve grabbed him by the back of the neck, pulling him close and whispered, I didn't hire you for your fucking opinion or cowardice. Now get your ass moving and expand our perimeter. To be honest, the overall consensus was that we needed to leave. And Steve knew it. I mean, we fucked with some terrible shit in our time. But three to four clans of Bigfoots? That was a bit too much. And the intel that we gathered only told us about one violent clan. We didn't even come prepared to deal with more than one clan. And last night, we ran through 35% of our munitions. If they attacked us two more times, we were fucked. So I pulled Steve to the side while everybody was cleaning up and I said, listen, brother, this is getting a little too sticky for us. 
We might need to think about getting the hell out of here before nightfall. He just looked at me and said, I know, I know, I know. Let's give it 24 more hours. And then we're out of here. I'm going to kill as many of these things as I can. Now, Steve knew this wasn't a good move. I could see it in his eyes. He realized that we were in way too deep. And the bad thing about it is, he wasn't the one that was going to pay the price. I was. We spent the rest of the day preparing defenses. Ben cleared more trees to give us a better line of sight. Karate Kid dug out two small ditches within our perimeter and filled them with gasoline as a way of using fire to separate the creatures and provide us more light so we can see. And no one was allowed to venture out from the camp at all. And with good reason. I know I saw two of those creatures watching us. They were there for a split second, then gone. At this point in time, I didn't know if we were going to survive the night. But I knew one thing for sure. We were prepared to fight tooth and nail. Smoke bombs, flashbangs, fire traps. This was going to be one night to remember. And by the time darkness fell, the camp was transformed into a target range. Gone were the safari tents and fancy equipment. It was about to go down. There was no fancy meal cooked by a chef that night. Straight up MREs, pinto bean stew is what we had. Shit was awful. Looking back on it, that almost was my last supper. The mood was tense as darkness grew. Everyone knew that tonight was going to be hell. We had no idea what we were about to face. Unlike the night before, things were normal until about 11.30. That's when the woods went silent. It was amazing, almost as if every living creature evacuated the area. Vitor signaled from high above us in a tree to let us know that he was seeing movement. The next thing you know, a freaking boulder comes flying in at us. Now listen, this is not a rock. Rocks about the size of your hand. This thing was the size of my chest. This was a boulder. It was like God got pissed off at us and it started raining boulders from the sky. I remember looking around and thinking to myself, man, we're in serious trouble. They're going to stay out of shooting range and just throw boulders at us. Just then, Vital began to fire in the opposite direction of where the boulders were coming from. Then he said something that I'll never forget. It's a distraction. Look behind you. By the time I turned around, Vital had begun to open fire full blast. And I could see huge shadows moving towards us. But it was not until Kid lit the first ring of fire that I realized what we were up against. Now I need you for a second to imagine this. As the first ring of fire began to ignite, one by one, the dark shadows surrounding us became clear. It looked like an army. This shit reminded me of something from the ancient days of the Roman Empire. They were all lined up. Some had boulders in their hands. Others had broken trees. I mean full-size trees. It had to be about 30 of these things. The small is 7 feet tall. Some were male and others were female. Vital stopped shooting for a moment and I swear it was like something out of a movie. From behind the line of creatures stands up this thing. I say it stood up because it had to be squatting down. This creature was 14 feet tall. Its hair illuminated this kind of reddish brown glow by the fire. And this was clearly their leader. Now I'm not bullshitting you. He dwarfed the others as he moved forward to the front of the line. At this point, I'm thinking I'm about to die a horrible death. I can see it in my head, my arms being ripped off, my legs being ripped off and being eaten alive. And if we had been led by anyone else, we probably would have died that night. I mean, you can feel the fear overwhelming each of us just like a pitcher left under the faucet running water. And just when we were intimidated, I heard this shot, and I knew it was from him. Steve had just fired his 50 cal Barrett. I watched as the 14 foot tall Bigfoot was hit dead center in his chest. The creature stumbled backwards for a few steps, bumping into others, then fell on his side. Steve had shot the leader in hopes that the rest of them would become afraid. And for a moment, it looked like it had worked. Until the largest female looked down at their leader pointed a finger at us and began to roar. Steve's second shot put a stop to that instantly. I can't tell you exactly where he hit her. 
but she fell to the ground, squirming, arms and legs flailing about. From that point on, it was non-stop shooting. Chef and Ben popped smoke at our rear to keep them from coming up behind us, while Kid chucked flashbangs into the direction of the others. The sound didn't seem to bother them, but the flash definitely stunned them, allowing us to kill 10 to 15 of these things with ease. The tide had turned in our favor, and I had just thought, man, I might just survive this shit, when I felt the ground shaking beneath my feet. Turning to my left, there it was, moving full speed directly at me with its mouth wide open. It looked like one of those Down Syndrome or retard kids we grew up with in school, except it was jet black. In his eyes, I'll never forget those eyes. They weren't set on the front of his head. They were kind of to the side. But the eyeballs actually rolled completely in as it fixed his gaze on me. I was only able to get off one shot before I went flying into the air. And just like on those cartoons where the Hulk throws something in the air and then punches it, well, that was me. And as my body was in mid-air, this thing took two steps forward, swung its forearm in a downward direction, striking my left thigh. I felt the bone break before I hit the ground. I was laying there, in pain, and it was just about to step on me when Ben shot it in the head with that AA-12 shotgun. After the first shot, it was still able to turn and look at him. Then it fell to the ground. From my position on the ground, I fired as many shots as I could. Man, I watched as Charlie was hitting the head with one of those boulders, splitting his skull. Chef was hit by a tree. This thing came flying in like somebody threw a frisbee, knocking him unconscious. Right at about 4.45 in the morning, things went silent. I didn't know if they were preparing for round two or if they had enough. But with three of us down and limited munitions, it was time for us to get the fuck out of Dodge. Ben did his best to tend to my broken femur, and somehow Vital was able to wake Chef up. But Charles, he was gone. There was nothing that could be done for him. With a splint on my leg and some drugs in my system, I was able to stand with assistance. Now able to stand, I witnessed firsthand the carnage. Blood, hair, everywhere. They didn't take the dead with them this time. They left them behind. To be honest with you, this was a massacre. And for the first time, I felt conflicted that day. I'm not sure if it was the drugs or my conscience, but I felt fucked up. We had wiped them out of existence. Or at least so I thought. Steve, ever focused, gave orders for us to start heading back to the boats. We were to leave everything behind except for our weapons and the remaining ammo. There was really nothing left. Everything had been destroyed that night. By the time we reached the river, the sun had fully risen. And again, the sense that we were going to make it out of this alive washed over me. I finally felt secure. That was until I started hearing this sound coming from behind us. It wasn't them coming for us. It was the sound of them weeping, moaning, almost as if they were crying for the loss of their family members. While all that was going on, Kid looked down at his GPS, confused. He said, the boats are supposed to be here, but according to this, they're 30 feet deep in the river. Steve looked at me and said, wait, what? You mean these things sunk our boats? And in that moment of confusion and fear, the meds wore off. The pain from my leg came rushing back, sending signals to my brain that said, bitch, you're hurt and you're in danger. Ben assisted me in sitting down on the ground and walked over to the riverbank. He just stared in the water as if he was Dark Vader and he could use the force to get the boats back. And Steve, he just looked at me with this kind of blank stare on his face. Because at that moment, I think he finally realized we were screwed. While we were coming to this realization, all you heard was them screaming and crying in the background. This ordeal was far from over. We had limited ammo and now no transportation.
an accurate assessment of our situation at this time would be to say that we are officially screwed. No transportation, low munitions, and we were miles away from the extraction point. In fact, there was no way to get there by foot. In retrospect, we should have left about 24 hours ago, and life would have been easy. Now, we're about to be hunted down like animals. As I sat there, I could feel the anguish and pain of these creatures. They were going to come and get us soon, and we needed to come up with a plan. For the first time ever, I looked into Steve's eyes and saw a level of fear as he paced back and forth along the riverbank with his head held high. I could see the gears in his head moving as he came up with a plan. Now, I already knew he had a plan to get us out of here. He was past that part. But he was worried about something. The pain in my leg was so severe that I started to feel dizzy. And the next thing you know, I blacked out. I was awakened by the feeling of water on my back. And when I opened my eyes, we were floating down river on these makeshift rafts made of logs. Steve was there kneeling next to me. He propped me up on his backpack, looked me square in the eyes, smiled and said, Glad to have you back in the land of the living. Where are we? I asked. Three miles down river. When I looked around, Vitor was towards the front of our raft, with his weapon in hand scanning the wood lines. Just behind us, about 30 yards, was a second makeshift raft that carried Chef, Ben, and Kid. For a moment there, I was relieved to know that we all were headed down river. That's when Steve handed me my weapon and said, This is not over. They're shadowing us in the wood line. Stay ready. Still, there was something wrong. The look of fear was still there in his eyes. That's when I said, Steve, tell me right now what's wrong. He and Vital both looked at me. You don't remember the ride up river? My mind was flooded with the visuals of the trip up river. And that's when I saw it. There's a section of this river where it narrows to only about 150 yards wide. Along that section, the riverbank slopes upward. And there's a rock face. This was a perfect point for them to attack us from. My next question was, how far down river are we from that point, Steve? He just looked at me and said, I'm not sure, but I hope we get there before dark. We need to get there before it gets dark. Looking over towards the tree line, I could see movement. These things indeed were following us down river. Now when I say movement, I'm not just talking about one or two trees moving. You could see the trees swaying back and forth as if these things were walking in single file lines. We were definitely not out of danger and everyone knew it. With the sun directly above my head, I knew I had a good four or five hours before the sun went down. So I rested, saving my strength for what was to come. The sound of the water was comforting in such a stressful situation. It made me think about Charlie. I didn't like him, but that was a horrible way to die. And for us to be forced to leave him was even worse. I'm sure he was being devoured by those beasts, his body torn apart limb by limb. It was one of the last things I remember before passing out again. That and the look of concern on Vital's face. The next time I was awoken was by the sound of gunfire. My vision was still foggy. My leg was in the most intense pain I'd ever felt in my life. But once I was able to focus, the situation looked bad. It was just about to turn dark and we were in the middle of that one mile stretch where the river got most narrow. Vitar was taking pot shots into the woods. Steve was kneeling holding his 50 cal and the second raft somehow had got ahead of us. The terrain had changed and the riverbank was only about 50 yards away. Beyond that was a rock face and looking up, I could see them moving along above us. As I reached for my rifle, Steve pointed back up river and said, Keep your eyes on the water. Several of them have already jumped in the river. If anything moves, kill it. I hesitated for a second, thinking, what the fuck are they doing in the water? But it made sense. If we can swim, why can't they? Next came the boulders, splashing down into the water from that rock face. I'll never forget it. And what made everything worse was I was feeling extremely weak. But I knew if we planned to get the hell out of here alive, I needed to fight. So I rolled over to my right side, took aim, and fired a shot. 
Now I wasn't thinking I was actually going to hit anything. This was just a way of me getting my adrenaline and endorphins going. But that's when I saw one jump off the rock face and into the trees. It was coming straight for us. I fired again, hitting it in the chest and then again in the shoulder. Its body and arms flung wildly as it continued to move forward and jumped into the river. Now we had one of these things in the water with us for sure. But I couldn't see it anywhere. On the raft ahead of us, they went from control burst to full automatic fire and began throwing flashbangs on the riverbank. That's when I noticed the straps and vines used to hold our raft began to bulge and move a bit, as if something was pushing the logs from beneath the water. Then, the weight shifted as this massive hand gripped the front right edge of the raft, right where Vital was standing. Without hesitating, he shot the hand and emptied the clip into the water, right at his feet, the river filling with blood. The next thing I remember is this loud explosion of force, water splashing everywhere. The raft that Ben and Kid stood on was flipped over, tossing him into the water. Seconds later, I saw Ben's head pop up first. Then I saw Kid swimming towards our raft. And as Ben struggled to hold on to his weapon and grasp one of the tree logs, I noticed that Chef had not come up yet. From that point on, it was an all-out gunfight. Steve firing a 50 cal. Vital firing. Kid had climbed on our raft and started firing. The whole while, Ben was holding on to a log barely out of the water and shooting his weapon at the same time. Several minutes passed before Chef's body came to back to the surface. When we were able to retrieve it, his neck had been broken. This firefight went on for the next 30 minutes. They had killed two of our team members. There was not going to be a third. We threw everything we had at them. I know that I personally killed another five of these creatures. And I saw Ben kill three more. And there's no telling how many that Steve killed with that 50 cal. Ten minutes later, everything went silent as the river widened and the creatures seemed to disappear. And during this expedition, we lost members of our little family. This was not the first time, but this was the worst exchange we'd ever been in. Steve looked down at me and smiled and said, we made it out alive, brother. Now you need to rest. I remember him sticking me with a needle. And when I woke up, my leg was in a cast and we were on a plane. There's not much more to share outside of that. We went to kill a clan of Bigfoots. We were successful, but at what cost? It cost us the lives of our friends. We never been back to Alaska to hunt any other creature. And after that experience, we'll probably never set foot back in Alaska again.